Hello, Talking Sense. I'm really excited about my next guest, Kyle Christensen. He is the VP of Marketing at Zora and also, little known fact, the creator of The Dark Funnel. So we're going to learn a lot here today with Kyle. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. Excited to be here. Thanks for cool. coming on. Yeah, you got it. Uh, I loved looking at your LinkedIn profile because you talked about great technology, but even more important than great technology is the story. Yeah. So when I look at the Zora pitch, yeah. what I do is I, I, I've broken it down and maybe, why don't I do this and you tell me yeah. if I'm right. Okay. Let's okay. See it. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to test. I'm going to test yeah. my knowledge of the great, how to do it. Yeah. So part one is the big trend. Mm -hmm. So some sort of industry shift mm -hmm. that is undeniable yep. and that creates the need to do something because even if you don't do something, you're going to be part of the big shift. Totally. totally. That right? Yeah, that's right. And like, I'd argue that's the most important part, but it's also the most challenging. So you don't think it is. No, right? I, no, I do. I think it's a, it's the thing that companies get wrong. I think that it's the thing that companies get afraid of leaning into. Um, it's the thing that sometimes your head of sales will say, yeah, but like, how's that going to drive leads? Right, but at the end of the day, it's the essence of, of it's the essence of what why why what you're doing is relevant, you know, not just to a buyer but to the broader market. So, well, that is, I have found that's the challenge yeah. is that people love the story, and they love the idea of the big trend, but yeah. then when they get in the room, they feel like the the I'm here, and they ask me what Six Sense does, and so I need to tell them what Six Sense does right now. Yeah, that's that's a lot a lot of the instinct, right? Just go straight to let me tell you how it works, right, and what this button does. And um, the challenge with that, the challenge with that instinct is that it just devolves the conversation straight into a feature function conversation. And then, you know, particularly if you're in a competitive space, um, the conversation really quickly goes to, well, you know, your competitor has this feature. What about that? How do these compare? And what you really want to do is have a conversation about um, it's a, it's a jujitsu move, right? You want to have a conversation, you want to reframe the playing field so you don't have to talk about the features. You don't want to compete with a particular feature function. You want to reframe the whole conversation so the feature function doesn't matter, right? So example from Salesforce, right? I used to work at Salesforce, Teen Zwell, our CEO, co-founder, he kind of learned this skill from Mark Benioff and early days of Salesforce, you know, we were the only SaaS platform out there and we wanted that to be the whole argument, right? Now, ultimately, when you're buying Salesforce CRM, you're buying, you know, lead, contact management, opportunity management, blah, 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 right? But what, we didn't want to go up to Siebel and say, look, our lead routing is better than their lead routing, right? Our forecasting is better than their forecasting. We said the whole conversation, the whole battle is about whether you're on-premise or whether you're SaaS. And like win that conversation. And if you win that conversation, you don't have to talk about, you know, the details behind opportunity forecasting, right? Because that's the whole game. So, so just it, it, it's dictating the new terms of, of the battle in a way that sets you up for success. So that's why leaning into that big shift or trend is so critical. Exactly, exactly. And then the second step, as I've taught myself, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, yeah. is to name an enemy. Yeah, yeah, if you can, have a, have a bad guy, right? <laughs> have, the, have the dude with the black hat and the mustache that you're going after. <laughs> So who is, who's Zora's enemy? Yeah, it's trickier. So like this, you know, this is the Salesforce playbook and there's was easy because it was Siebel and everybody hated Siebel, right? So it was, it was really easy. Um, it's not always possible where you have like that clear cut of a bad guy, um, you know? And so in our world, um, the, the, the bad guy, it's not, a, it's not a software company. It's the bad guy is the old way of doing things, right? So we like to talk about, hey, the, the future is companies who can move to a subscription-based business model or recurring business model. And if you're not making that shift and you're stuck in a world where you're still selling things and stuff selling services, you're left behind. Right? And so the, the bad guy is, is apathy or the bad guy is the risk of, sort of not doing anything. The challenge for us is we don't have a direct replacement in terms of the software we're trying to replace. Um, wish we did, but that's always fun. If you can find, you know, that, who's the enemy that specifically you're going after that does it the old way, uh, it's much easier. And so then the next step is to paint winners and losers. So this big shift is going to create winners and losers. That's right. Right? That's it. Yeah, so that's where we're going. We don't have the bad guys. So we say, yeah, it could be because we're creating a market, right? But the the winners are the one who you make it so obvious that like, of course, you know, people are, are moving to subscription-based business models. Look at the success that all these software companies have had. Look at the success that, you know, in digital media, that companies like Spotify and Netflix have had. Um, 
you start to look at other industries. You say, look at you know what Ford Motor Company is doing, thinking about reimagining their business from being about rolling cars off an assembly line to selling transportation, right, as a service. And like, if you don't get on board with this, you're going to get left behind. You're going to be a dinosaur, just like Siebel was in the on-premise days. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So we've got big trend. We've got enemy and or winners or losers. Mm -hmm. And then next is promise link. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's unveiling, you know, look, we show you, it's instilling the the fear of doing nothing, right? Painting a picture like you're going to, you know, you're going to be a dinosaur, you're going to be dead if you don't go this direction. But it's okay. We're going to show you the way. We're going to show you an enlightened path to what life could be like, you know, if only you decided to make this big leap. And the trick there, though, is you still don't talk about your product. It's not about us, right? So again, you talk about Zora. Um, look, we're a billing platform, right? We do billing, we do payments, we do revenue automation. Um, but leading to the promised land is making a decision to change your business model. Change your business model from a one-time product-centric model to a recurring subscription-based service business model. Just make that choice. And you know, really like the Salesforce story, just make the choice to go from on-premise to SaaS. And once you make that choice, we can then maybe start talking about the product. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And then, so promise land. Yeah. And then capabilities that you have to have. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now you're classic product marketing, right? And you're, you're teeing up yourself and your product to say, look, we know what our differentiators are ahead of time. And obviously just setting those up as being the killer must have capabilities. And then last is proof. Sure. Customer stories. Customer stories. Exactly. Talking sense. Well, I thought you had a cool graphic and an interesting take on a T funnel. So look, there's the, there's the classic, you know, serious decisions, demand gen waterfall. Um, and that mental model for me, I mean, it's simplified, right? But the mental model is something more like a, a Dropbox, right? In, in B2B world where you're like, look, anybody can be a customer. Um, cast a wide net, you know, get a bunch of leads, get them to the website, convert them on the website, you know, what's your conversion rate all the way down through. Um, and you measure the whole business that way. And that works for certain business models. Um, for us, it's a little different because again, we, we look at a universe of a few thousand companies and our goal is just to get them to engage with us. Um, we don't know when they're going to buy. We know eventually they buy. We know eventually all these companies are going to go subscription. They're going to need a product like Zora. Um, so our goal is to kind of visualize like this slipstream of companies who are just sort of paying attention to us, downloading our content, coming to our events. It's okay that they're not ready to buy, right? They're just kind of engaging with our, with us as our brand and our content. And at some point, something's going to happen in one of these companies where they're like, we're ready to launch our first subscription product. And when they do, they just, they drop straight through the funnel, right? So the, the sales cycle goes really, really fast. And so our funnel looks a little bit more like that. The goal is get people engaged keep them in the slipstream and then just be there for when they're ready to like shoot down. And know that timing. Exactly. So you're the first one. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I do think, I think we all have to rethink the traditional demand gen waterfall and if it works for our business model. Um, now, one of the things that you invented, I understand, a dark funnel. How did you come up with that concept? Why do you think it works? Yeah, I don't know if I'll take full credit for, for coming up with it, but- uh, I'm gonna give did, you full credit. I'll take it, I'll take it. <laughs> Sorry, Jason. Um, um, look, this, everyone knows the stat, right? That I forget the exact percent, but something like, it's like 75, 78% of the buyer's journey is, is already complete by the time someone picks up the phone and talks to sales. And, um, you know, we all know this. I'm doing research for, you know, on a, on a MarTech product I'm trying to buy. I'm going to go kick the tires on the website, right? I'm going to go read reviews. I'm going to do everything I can to learn as much as I can about that thing before I want to have the slightest interaction with, with somebody in sales. And um, my challenge, you know, as a marketer has always been, man, like I'm just missing out on all this stuff. Like I know it's my own behavior. Um, I know people are checking out our website. I know they're filling out junk data in my forms because they don't want a phone call. Um, and that's a lot of my work, right? A lot of the content we're producing, so all right, it's so sad. <laughs> you know, it's, is, is we're just blind to what's going on. And so, you know, there's the known funnel, which is the obvious stuff that people who are filling out forms and responding to your emails, but like all this other stuff, it sits in this, this dark place, the dark half of the funnel. And so, um, you know, six cents, but you know, a lot of new technologies out there to help sort of shine a light on that, give you the full picture of what's going on is, is just, uh, it's so important. Do you gate your content or not gate your content? I would love to not gate my content. I would love to have everything open. Um, 
operationally. But you're scared. You're scared. I'm not scared. We're just we we got to make all the pipes and the wires work behind the scenes to make sure it still works. Because at the end of the day, look, we still have to create leads, get leads routed, right, and have a whole system to to you know to follow up. So there's a whole machinery involved with that. And, you know, we're we're an international global company, so there's, there's a lot. So it's it's easier said than done, I think. But um, we're we're on that journey. I'll put it that way. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I think I'm just lucky in that I, I am running our process on Sixth Sense yeah. and have sort of started that way. Yeah. So it makes it easier. It's, it's hard to unwind it's, things that are already in place. No, we're on that journey, right? So so we have uh, a subset of our stuff that's ungated. Um, we're trying to marry sort of old world and new world and bring it together in a way that makes sense for our business right now. Let's talk about marketing and sales alignment. So mm -hmm. first off, we went through the five elements of the pitch, but how do you get salespeople to feel comfortable taking that step back and and leaning in yeah. to that story? Yeah, I think the, the trick, first of all, is you need complete buy-in on this whole thing, right? If this is just marketing out there, advocating for it, it's it's really, really tough. And um, and sales folks will do what sales folks, sales folks do and it's what they're used to doing. So um, I've been fortunate that the companies I've been a part of who do a good job of this, they get buy-in all the way at the you know, CEO all the way down. Um, but beyond that, um, even if it was top down, uh, if it didn't work, people wouldn't do it, right? So the reality is it works. Uh, and I think, you know, um, we see new salespeople coming into the organization who haven't seen this stuff before. Sure enough, we're like, nope, you gotta do it. They start pitching it that way. Um, they're like, oh, this feels, this feels new, this feels different, it feels pretty good. Or you come to one of our events, right? And you see that we'll do a two hour keynote and maybe 15 minutes of it will be about our product capabilities, right? And the rest is about the larger trend that's taking place. And you see, you know, that people from all over the globe are flying to these things because that's the content they actually want, right? They don't want to sit and watch a 90 minute sales presentation, right? And they want to learn about the macro trends that are driving you know, everything around them. So. Plus those onstage demos are always a disaster. <laughs> like no one can see. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Good you know marketing I mean? team. You should come to one of our shows. Right, you I do will, good I demos. Will, you I do. Will. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, so when you train people, do you make them go through that pitch or that story and just have them practice? Yeah. Yeah. That's a part of it. But look, the other part of it is, is following it all the way through, right? You, if you just stop at, at the big vision um, and you don't train people how to take it home ultimately to, to, to business value, um, then... It's not going to work, right? So you do have to you do have to do the classic value prop building, business case building stuff too. And so to really train on it thoroughly, you got to run through the whole exercise, and that way people see how it's all connected all the way down. Gotcha. So yeah, we need pitch practice, but then it's also like this is how it leads to how you demo the product. This is how it leads to how you build a business case, and you can follow the thread all the way through, and then it then it kind of clicks for everybody. Gotcha. Okay, so again on sales alignment. Yeah. How are you keeping the sales team up to date? You talked about this T funnel mm -hmm. and all of a sudden stuff is moving. Mm -hmm. Like how do you make sure they're engaged and following up and doing the things they need to do? They're gonna do what's easiest and what's fastest, right? Uh, which is what you should do if you're a rep, right? Uh, and so anything that's extra effort, it just doesn't get done. And so uh, we work really hard on making sure the operations infrastructure puts the right signals in their face at you know, exactly the right point in time. And so lots of different ways you can do that depending on you know, what your setup is. Um, some folks like email notifications, some organizations are really big into chatter, you can inject stuff into chatter. Um, ours, we tend to use dashboards uh, and reports, but it's part of the daily operations of like the SDR organizations. They come in, they're, they're trained every day, I go to this one place and I can see exactly everything that's happened and it's, you know, we, we package up and make it really easy for them. So like the six cents stuff, the fact that it sits right inside the account object and you can go there one place and see exactly like everything has happened makes it really, really easy. So, I mean, you're this phenomenal, well-known product marketer. You just took a new job, pretend, here's the product. What do you do? How, how do you think about, like, what's your process? when you approach a new job and a new, yeah. new piece of technology? Yeah. I really like trying to come up with stories for products that I don't know that much about, to be honest. 
um, because you get to approach it with, with fresh eyes. Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, you Sometimes know, you like know too much. Totally. Yeah. You know, the curse of knowledge, right? We know too much about it. It's hard to pull up. And so, um, you know, I, I really ask a lot of dumb questions, right? And, and really, you know, have people try to explain it to me and do the constant, like, well, I don't really get it. Like, could you explain it again? Like, try like, like really help, really dumb it down and help me, help me understand how it works. And, and also see the, see everything through the eyes of, you know, a user, uh, uh, through the eyes of a buyer, right? And like sitting on the other side of the desk and just thinking through like day to day, like what's my life like, what are my challenges? And then marrying those two things together. Um, so it's like a fresh eyes perspective is one. Um, but then you also have to like go deep at the same time, right? So you also gotta then get in with your product managers and be like, all right, let's be honest, like what are the killer capabilities here? Right? Like what are the, the three or four things that are like the most valuable, most important things that we gotta hit on? And you know, like bring those two things together. That's the fun part. Now, do you find there's a sweet spot of, of differentiators? Um, look, I, I, I don't know if there's a science behind this, but it's like three, right? <laughs> the ma- magic number three, if you can like land on three things, uh, it, uh, it, it feels like, you know, um, anything more than that, you know, it's like, kind of like, yeah, like, let, let me tell you like the 84 reasons why, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you like, you lose people. Um, two doesn't feel like enough. Right? <laughs> I don't know. It's just three. It's like a magic three. I don't know what it is. Well, they say that there's, they've done studies that people remember threes and fives. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. They've done like studies on that. So there you go. It just feels right. I don't know. Yeah. I find it's a challenge for people to let go of what's not a differentiator and be okay with that. Yeah, totally. Especially folks who like get really jazzed about the product. Right. And it's like, it could be a feature that, um, you know, that all of our customers love. I want to use, but at the end of the day, like everyone has it, uh, it's tough. So, so we do the next exercise with a two by two. We just visualize two dimensions. One dimension is customer value. Uh, how much, how important is this to the customer? And the other is how unique is it to us? And uh, really honing in on those things that land in the quadrant that are both, right? And it's, it's really tempting to, you know, just look through the lens of, hey, this is what the customer's value, but like ignore that stuff, right? Uh, focus really in on, on the stuff that, that hits in that upper right quadrant. I love that. Yeah. That's a great tip. Yeah. What's working now to kind of get above the noise? Oh, that's a great question. Um, look, we, when we do marketing, um, we try to not emulate other SaaS companies, right? We try to look at the way people consume information in their personal lives and, you know, what's interesting and try to put out content that looks and feels like that, right? The stuff that I would want to read on the weekend. Uh, or like at home, you know, when I get when I get home from work. And so like as an example, um, we put out a magazine, like a glossy magazine that would look like a, you know, uh, a modern sort of business publication. And we invest a lot in it, right? It's got like cool photography. We bring our customer stories into it. And it's a great read, right? And people love it. So they, you know, they, they grab them like when they come to the office, they're reading on the plane. Um, that's an example. Um, we really leaned into everything we've learned over the last 10 years and having a first row seat to the subscription economy and everything that's changing. And we wrote a book about it. Um, our CEO I saw did. that. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, Teen wrote a book about it. And it's a New York Times bestseller, right? Um, so so stuff like that, right? I think I, I love what you guys are doing with this show, right? Um, I visualize like, and this is, we're not there yet, right? But I'm going to copy a lot of this stuff. Um, <laughs> I said, don't look at SaaS companies for inspiration. I'm yeah. Copy stuff. <laughs> But what, but what I like about it, right, is like I would love to have instead of a resource center on our, our website like you see, like we have today, right, I'd rather it look like um, you're browsing Netflix, right, and there's a bunch of content there and you can subscribe to stuff Justin, and get updates. that's what we want. Yeah. Netflix. All right. I'll, I'll race you guys. Let's see you can come up with it. Uh, but like, you know, that's the way I visualize these things is, is you know, um, don't, don't go emulate, you know, your favorite software company, right? Go emulate... Um, what Netflix is doing, go emulate what media companies are doing to get success today. I think one of the things you said in your presentation, which I also took away, was you hire a journalist. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we do. Um, again, we want to write the type of content that you would want to read if you're checking out the New York Times, right? And so uh, we don't go hire folks you know, with content marketing titles. We go hire folks who literally have journalism backgrounds. It's cool because they write that way and they think that way. They think in narrative format. Uh, But the other cool thing about journalists is they're trained to really, really quickly get ramped up on a lot of different complex topics. 
right? So you can hire a small number of these folks and you can say, look, go deep with this customer. It's really easy for them to sort of quickly get under the hood and like grok what the most important things are or go talk to this product person, right? And they don't have to be a product expert, but they can tease out the stuff that matters the most. So there's multiple value levers for doing that. Love it. So you had my job before and we're wildly successful. I'm still trying to figure it out. What do I do next? How do we evolve the Sixth Sense story? That's a good question. What's your advice for me? How do you evolve the story? I think, you know, one of the challenges in the MarTech space, and I'm sure you're feeling this, is um, there's a lot of really cool emerging tech that's out there. And um, there's, there's a lot of overlap in terms of not only product capabilities, but also narrative. And oh, everyone says the same everyone thing. Everyone says the same thing, right? And, you know, a lot of companies will say the same thing and they'll have half their functionality completely overlap and the other half do totally different things. But then there's a third person that comes in and sort of overlaps both of them, but also does its own things. And it's a challenge as a buyer, right? Because we end up having duplicate technology for certain things, but you have to have that unique thing. So you end up buying a new vendor and then you got to get it all working together. So it's an exciting time in MarTech because there's a lot of cool shit out there. How do you decide marketing automation or like your cadence based call it salesforce or outreach like do you see a time where you don't have a marketing automation solution i visualize waking up in the morning coming into work and like seeing this heat map and envision like a big you know like big grid right you know, like oh that one turned green that one turned green oh that one went red what happened and being able to like magically go great give me all the red ones package them up boom spit out that campaign that's going to get uh that's going to get noticed and so do you need a marketing automation for that? I don't know, that doesn't feel account-based, right? That feels like build a segment, send some emails to all the CMOs out there. Um, but but something would say, got it. No, but I love it. I love this matrix concept. Yeah. Right, and, and yeah. the heat map. And it's your dark funnel and your known funnel. Yeah, exactly, you're seeing everything. And so so that's a key part of it. And then you're like, you see the little you know red account or you just group of red accounts and you're like, deploy, right? And so what goes out? Well, not just emails. Right, but sure, there's probably some email in there, but it's also the ads start hitting, right? And there's also a timer that says like, great, like ZBR call, right? And these things run and you can just spin them up, you know, every day when you walk in, you know, spin Social, up Social, direct mail. Totally, yeah, totally. So, you know, like I, it's still automating your marketing, right? But it feels really different from what it feels like to like log into Marketo today. Yeah, I think I talk about it being a dance. Yeah. And the solution being able to like keep time with the prospect and it being multi-tactic, so ad versus versus email versus direct mail, cadence based, but all kind of keeping in time with their signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had to try this on too. We had this other concept. This is a uh, our CEO's concept is is Russian hacker marketing. What does that mean? This is like you know, look, go back to the election, you know, uh, 2016, and like a small number of Russians for like not a lot of money could figure out like, what are some messages that are really gonna like get people going? And like, let me let me figure out how to just implant those ideas in those people's head uh, through social media ads, right? And so- Oh my well, God, that's yeah. interesting. And you're like, look, a small group of Russian hackers can dramatically change the opinions of a bunch of people sitting in the United States. Like, look, as sophisticated B2B marketers, it doesn't have to be as nefarious, right? But the concept is the same, right? Like I have a, a great positive idea about uh, something that's valuable and relevant to a CFO who's my buyer, um, what are all the tools I can use to sort of just to get these CFOs to start thinking about these concepts, right? And um, take my grid, right? See all the red accounts, press play, the Russian hacker campaigns go out the door and suddenly these ideas are like implanted in the brains of CFOs everywhere. Um, that's kind of cool. So that's the future of that's marketing. That's the future, that's it. We're all Russian hackers. Yeah. I love it, I love it. So we talked about all the great things that you've done. Yeah. What's your colossal fuck up? Oh man. Ah, uh, there's so few and far between. I know, yeah, yeah. I know. It's I, it's it's hard <laughs> to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna start out. Really cool company. It's a company called Invoca. Um, um, uh, still doing really well. They do. Uh, it's it's like marketing automation for phone calls is basically what the company does. Right? They connect phone calls into digital marketing. So pretty cool for companies that like have 800 numbers and stuff. Anyway. Um, it was Dreamforce, and we were coming up with some campaign that we wanted to run um, that was going to, it's Dreamforce, so it's massively crowded, right? You know, like we're oh, trying yeah. to get attention for ourselves. And so we had the idea, um, we're going to 
roll trucks around uh, Dreamforce in Moscone with like this big ad with like lipstick on it. And it says for a good time, call and a phone number. And so we spent all this money on like getting it comped up and mocked up. And it was cool because you have to call the 800 number, you got a pitch and then it was all dialed in. It was our message. So, you know, there was nothing scandalous about it except for, you know, the idea behind the message. And anyway, we spent all this money, rented the trucks and I didn't tell our CEO about it. Um, and I just assumed, oh, he's going to love this. He did not love it. It was, it did not go over well, but the money was spent. And so, you know, he's like, all right, like, if this doesn't go well, like, you're out. But uh, turned out I was all right. Turned out I was all right. It didn't, uh, you know, we got some social buzz. Uh, didn't didn't make the leads roll in, but but didn't didn't fuck up enough to get me fired. So gotcha. Yeah, that's a pretty How's bold that? move. So Kyle, thank you so much for coming on Talking Sense. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was awesome. We talked. We covered a lot of ground. So we talked about the five elements of a great pitch and how people can come up with one and adopt one. We talked about think kind of reimagining your funnel, right? And understanding the way your buyers buy, but most important being in the pocket when That's they're right. ready to That's buy. Right. And last, of course, the dark funnel and how as B2B buyers, we've got to understand that dark funnel and maybe use, what is it? Russian jujitsu moves or That's hacker it. moves. Exactly that to get after it. So thanks again, Kyle, yeah. and look forward to meeting with you soon. Sounds good.